I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. The book of Revelation, the last in the Bible, and the most controversial work in the entire epic saga. 22 chapters describe horrific scenes of bloodshed, plague, and cataclysmic disaster as the beast with the number 666 and four avenging horsemen are let loose. It's a horrifying vision of the end of the world in which all but a handful of the Christian faithful are wiped out. To Carl Jung, one of the great psychoanalysts of the 20th century, these pages held a veritable orgy of hatred, wrath, vindictiveness, and blind destructive fury. To D.H. Lawrence, the world imagined was hideous. For centuries, many Christians have chosen to ignore the Book of Revelation, its supernatural visions too problematic to unravel. Others have embraced its violent images, believing the book can scare the faithful into piety. This is the tradition I was brought up with. I was taught that the book of Revelation was literal truth, but I believe there's more to it than the death and destruction that most people know. I want to discover if this strange and confusing book deserves its bad reputation, or whether centuries of misuse and abuse have obscured its true meaning. And the first went, and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. The book of Revelation is the terrifying resolution to the Christian Bible. The shocking images in this prophetic narrative are, it is said, a record of the words of God spoken to Jesus Christ in a vision to a man called John, but more about him later. In Revelation, a door is opened to heaven and John witnesses the events that will lead to a climactic battle between God and Satan. At the centre of the story is a book sealed seven times. The opening of each seal unleashes another vision of the horrifying experiences mankind will face before the last judgment and salvation. He sees the four horsemen bring destructive fury and the wrath of God before which every living soul cowers, while Satan, who gets a starring role in the book, appears in the guise of the beast who is marked with the number 666. But within all this, John sees a glorious future in which Satan is defeated and cast into a lake of fire. In the final verses, all humanity is called forth to be judged by the Creator. Those found worthy are granted salvation in God's new Jerusalem here on earth. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I was raised in the Midlands in the 1970s. My parents were Pentecostals, and I loved going to church. We were taught to believe fervently that our lives were driven by the Word of God. And for three hours, twice a day, Sunday after Sunday, I worshipped with my parents and my eight sisters. At home and at church, we were taught to believe that the words of the Book of Revelation were quite literally true, a step-by-step -step guide to the end of the world. In the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. As Bible believers, we understood that the Spirit of God was present in our daily lives and that He saw everything. When I was a boy, this scared me into obedience. If I was good, then I'd be spared at the Last Judgment. But if I sided with Satan, I'd be condemned to face eternal torment. Father, as we have obeyed your word, we pray that you open the windows of heaven and you flood us with blessings. Why should we be interested in the book of Revelation? Well, first of all, it's, it's probably the, the sort of the best 
airport novel that there is in the Bible that you can get hold of. I mean, it really is. It's popular literature. It's sort of New Moon meets uh, Da Vinci Code, all mixed together. So it's a fabulous read at one level. At another level, it is probably one of the most dangerous books in the world. So to ignore it would be, in fact, to turn your back on something that has shaped who and what we are. Explain this danger to me. I think it's dangerous because I think it fundamentally subverts the Jesus of the Gospels. And I think that's a problem because then it legitimates violence, whereas the, the Gospels show a Jesus who turns his back on violence. I mean, we have to remember, Robert, that the early church was very ambiguous about whether this book should be in the Bible at all. Most of the church didn't want the book of Revelation included in the canon of the Bible, which was basically fixed around about 382 AD. It only made it in because it was believed to have been written by the beloved disciple of Jesus, John. And I think it, we would have been better off without it. However, we had it. It has given us a sense that there are epoch moments when if you can read the signs, you can change the course of the entire history of the world. I'm on a journey to redeem Revelation. Do you think it's possible? No. I think you're on a fool's errand. I really do. It's a living book. And the Bible is relevant to every generation. Amen. Even though it was written all these years ago, you can't say that, oh, it was only for that generation. Amen. Because it's the same God that is behind his word. Because of who? Whether we're familiar with the Bible or not, the world imagined in Revelation saturates our existence. Almost daily, we're faced with events of unimaginable horror and turn to the apocalyptic language in search of understanding. Popular culture delights in its grotesque visions and our nightmares are inhabited by such figures as the beast with seven heads and the whore of Babylon. But if I'm to reclaim this work, and celebrate its place within the Bible, I have to uncover the world from which it sprang. The small Greek island of Patmos, in what was once Asia Minor, is dominated by the Monastery of St. John the Divine and the Holy Cave of the Apocalypse. And it was here that the final, and arguably the most controversial book in the New Testament, is believed to have been written. The writer names himself as John in the opening verses, and traditional thought holds that he was Christ's disciple, author of the Gospel of John. At the time of writing in the first century, a new faith, founded on the teachings of Jesus Christ, was spreading through the region, but its devotees risked punishment at the hands of the ruling Roman Empire. When John's writing, you're at a time when the Roman Empire is at the height of its strength. People are even beginning to worship the emperor. So you've got Christians who are probably being persecuted. You've got people who are feeling under pressure from political authorities. So what they're doing is they're talking about how even though they've suffered, even though they've shed blood, ultimately they will be victorious. So much of what Revelation is about is about these Christians who have borne testimony to Jesus. For most people today, the word apocalypse means the end of time. But the literal meaning from the Greek is the lifting of a veil. And that's what happened here. This is the cave where, according to tradition, John had his revelation and received the word of God. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. We don't know the exact spot where Christ stood, but we do know that when the voice of God was heard, the rock split in three places. This symbolizes the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was here, in this holy cave, that the voice of God was heard. This is a sacred space, the point where John receives his vision from God, the three fissures in the rock representing the Trinity, and out of this, bursting the light and these amazing visions of the world. It's moving. 
thinking about a man suffering persecution but being inspired to write down his dreams. Yet this book is not the scribblings of a man overwhelmed by religious experience. It is an exquisite literary and ornate text. But is John really writing down the word of God or is he trying to communicate something else? What happens is people like John write as a persecuted minority, as a group that feels threatened by this great, huge Roman Empire. So what it does is it uses symbols and signs and picture language to try and repaint the picture of the world that they're living in. There's something rather reassuring to those that are reading them. If you read a book and you understand the symbol, you understand the sign, you go, aha, I've got it. And that's partly what John's trying to do there. You're supposed to recognize these things. You go through and say, ah, oh, yes, I see that in our lives. Help me work through some of the common assumptions. Usually in Revelation, when you're getting talk about 666, about the number of the beast, about the whore of Babylon, it's Rome that's in view. So he calls Rome Babylon, because Babylon was a great empire of the past. He uses the number 666, which probably is a symbol of the Emperor Nero, the notorious Roman emperor in the 60s of the first century. And the Whore of Babylon, again, it's a representative of that great Roman empire that people saw as being so oppressive and being something that they had to kind of fight against. What's the danger of reading it literally? It isn't a book that is giving you a literal, detailed picture of exactly how things will be. So when in Revelation it talks about when the new heaven and the new earth arise, you'll be nuts if you try to kind of work out the exact date when this thing's going to happen. What happens is you warp it and you try and make it work for whatever your own particular agenda is. And that's always a problem. It's this clash of interpretations that has encouraged centuries of argument about the book's meaning. Prophecy versus allegory. Believing that every word is true and that faith alone will save us, as I was taught as a child, or using the stories in Revelation to provoke change for the betterment of society. This is the reading that excites me today. But what happens when the prophetic reading is taken to the extreme? In February 1993, American federal authorities were involved in an attack on a small Christian sect called the Branch Davidians, holed up in Waco, Texas. The group was led by the messianic David Koresh, who tried to spread his message throughout the world. His tongue is the pin of a... Ready, right. So how's God going to talk to me in the latter days? It's going to be written. And who's going to bring that book? No. So there'll be no excuses! Koresh believed the events unleashed by the opening of the seven seals in Revelation were taking place in the world around him. Even the attack could be seen as a sign that the end was coming. I remember watching the events unfold in 1993 on television and wondering to myself, how could the book of Revelation lead to such catastrophic consequences? I'm about to meet a man I'm hoping will provide answers. Livingston Fagan was a British member of the Branch Davidians who was at Waco as the events unfolded and a follower of David Koresh. So what was David Koresh's understanding of the book of Revelation? The thing was, David had an experience in 1985 on a visit to Jerusalem where, I'll put it just directly here of it, he was visited by an angel. He had an illumination. And um, that experience was what was the basis for everything that followed. Clarify that for me. He was visited by an angel mm -hmm. and the angel showed him that revelation was coming to pass. We were... That's right, the events, the prophecies spoken of in the book of Revelation. How should I understand revelation and see this moment in history? At this stage, we're going through what is the judgment. This has to do with the book Sealed with Seven Seals and the information that was contained in there. A 51-day siege followed the authorities' assault at Waco ending in a blazing inferno. Livingston Fagan's wife and mother were amongst those who died. How did you feel when you saw loved ones, people you knew, then being, being slaughtered? Um, Robert, this really wasn't about feelings. It was about prophecy. 
Yes, essentially, and faith. Come on, when you saw Christ on the cross, Father, forgive them, but they know not what they do. Or it wasn't about his feelings. Now, sure, it hurt that our loved ones were killed. But the point about this is that um, that should not overwhelm or override our faith in God. We had hoped that our attackers would at least hear us because really the message was about salvation. When I read the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. I see it as a book to inspire me, to inspire every age to resist tyranny and empire. Now, it could, it could, but then that would be interpretation, not fulfillment. When you saw Waco and the people that were there, would you conclude that they were inspired by the word? I no, don't know because- oh, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you think that in their thinking, yeah. they were inspired? Yes. Okay, and in their thinking, they were resisting tyranny? No. So when the government came against us the way that they did, we weren't resisting tyranny? Well, you have, well, only no, no, you can on, tell on. me. But, no, hold on, the no, government no, no, came on. against us with tanks, helicopters yeah. to kill us. Why? No, it's not why, but the question I'm asking here is, don't you think we were resisting tyranny? I... Don't you think that we were following our conscience and our faith? Yes. Do you think people have completely misunderstood? Absolutely. Where but then God doesn't judge them for that. I understand why the Branch Davidians would have felt persecuted by the authorities, and I do respect Livingston Fagan for holding fast to what he believes, despite all he's been through. But it shows me how dangerous revelation can be when it's read literally. It's hard to imagine the tragic events of Waco taking place in Britain. We celebrate our faith more privately. But it seems to me, from the very beginning, America has broadcast a powerful commitment to God. As every dollar bill reminds us, in America, it's in God they trust. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. In 1620, a small group of Christian separatists known as the Pilgrim Fathers left Britain in search of a world in which they could practice their zealous form of Protestantism. At the heart of their faith was an absolute belief in the word of the Bible and a commitment to build a pure, new world worthy of God's presence. The American Puritans had a sense that God had somehow chosen them for a special purpose, to create here on earth a divine model of what human society could be if people truly followed the Word of God. Where did they find text in the Bible to give them this sense that they were here, God had called them, and something new was to take place? Well, they found text throughout the Bible. The book of Revelation provided a model for what the Puritans in, in an ideal sense believed that they could achieve. A beautiful passage, there will be no more tears, God shall wipe away their tears. It just, you know, it's a very inspiring passage. So the, the book of Revelation provided both an inspiration of a glorious future, but also the most frightening kind of warnings of what would happen to those who did not follow Christ and uh, fell into wickedness. Just 70 years after the Puritans arrived, the wickedness they feared did appear in their midst. In 1692, 20 people were executed in Salem, Massachusetts for alleged witchcraft offenses. The new world had become corrupted by the presence of Satan. Satan was believed to use human agents to achieve his purposes. Then, if you add on to that a belief in witchcraft that human beings can uh, sell out to the other side, go to the dark side, uh, this creates a climate of potentially of intense suspicion and fear, not only at some abstract supernatural power, but at one's own neighbors. The witchcraft hysteria began at the home of the Reverend Samuel Paris, when his daughter and niece began exhibiting strange behavior. 
Unable to cure them, a local doctor declared that they were under the evil hand. The Reverend Samuel Paris preached a powerful sermon uh, in Salem Village uh, in September 1692 at the height of the outbreak. He chose his text from the book of Revelation, chapter 17. Uh, here is the, the lamb shall make war uh, and uh, the lamb shall triumph. Uh, and he elaborated the meaning of that. Uh, there are only two forces in the world, the lamb and the dragon, Christ and Satan. You must be on one side or the other. So where is revelation in the contemporary America? The post 9-11 context, I think, was one in which uh, prophetic, apocalyptic worldviews uh, tended to be particularly attractive. Opinion polls I've seen tend to show about 30 to 40 percent of people when asked say that uh, the world will end uh, in a battle at Armageddon between Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. Now that doesn't mean that 40 percent of Americans are going around day in and day out obsessed with this. This is sort of in the back of people's minds, but it can surge forward uh, under proper circumstances. It's amazing to think that over three centuries later, the battle between the dragon and the lamb is still taking place. Many Americans believe they have a God-given mission to create the New Jerusalem. The battle in Salem between good and evil is now being played out on a global stage, and America has cast itself on the side of good or God. It's an alliance that has huge consequences for us all. I know. We can overcome evil with greater evil empire. Good. Thank you, and God bless you all. God bless you, and God bless America. Struggle between right and wrong, and good and evil. We can heal this nation. We can repair the world. God bless you. Evil is real, and it must be opposed. God is near. And one day, with God's help, there to help you, God. So help me, God. To see faith in Revelation at work today, I'm on my way to Richland Creek Community Church in North Carolina. And we have seen the power of this book as it unveils to us Jesus Christ. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not a difficult book to follow. The only time it becomes difficult is when you try to allegorize or spiritualize all these things and insert your own meanings into the text. So you read the book of Revelation literally. Why? Well, I think God's word is to be taken literally. He's not trying to confuse people. He's not trying to deceive people. This is actually the very breath of God on paper. If we just take God's word for what it says, we're gonna get an understanding of his heartbeat, his love for people, and the fact that he's coming again. My opinion would be that you're wrong in reading it literally mm -hmm. because it's actually a book of code mm -hmm. and symbols and about the first century. How would you respond to that? Well, there's nothing in the Bible that would seem to indicate that we should read it in code. God's saying, hey, believe what I'm saying about these events. They're actually going to go down the way it's described right there in the book. And God is giving us a timetable, setting us up for his little return. As a Bible-believing Christian, yeah. as a man who loves the Lord, loves your congregation, what do you make of the image of God in Revelation? I think that's a great question because I think people want to picture God as a God of love and a God of hope. And he's all those things, but he's also a God of wrath for those who are opposed to him and opposed to his way. He warns us about the judgment that's coming. So we can't say that God hasn't been fair. If you read it literally, you end up with a timeline for the end of the world. And I think that literal reading promotes passivity mm -hmm. and complicity mm -hmm. as opposed to resistance and fighting for a more just order. That's why your interpretation worries me. Mm -hmm. I've already said what I had to say about it, so um, look, the Bible is to be taken at face value. And when you say it's simplistic, I agree with that. He literally is coming again. He literally is going to fight the battle at Armageddon. He literally is going to make all things new, a new heavens and a new earth. In this part of the U.S., in North Carolina, would you support political candidates who were unchristian, who didn't read the Bible in the way that you read it? Well, me personally, I would love to support a candidate who holds to 
the teachings found in God's Word, because there you're going to have a candidate who ascribes to that which is right, defined by God, not by man. And so the moral attributes of that candidate are reflected in his uh, adherence to the Word of God. Pastor Sims's teaching of Revelation is very familiar to me, but I'm no longer seduced by the book's power to prey on my darkest fears. Where in his reading is that hopeful message of resistance that I now believe is fundamental to a true understanding of the book. In April 1981, a London community was torn apart as residents took to the streets to protest against racial harassment. Riots spread through Brixton, and over two days, more than 350 people were injured and houses and shops burned. When the writing took place, I was 16 and living in the Midlands. I remember going to church and hearing my pastor praise the Pentecostal youth of Brixton for not being involved in the writing. As far as he was concerned, their suffering was part of God's plan and they didn't need to be involved in the affairs of this world because their salvation was assured. I had a big problem with that. If racism and social inequality were part of God's plan, then perhaps the plan was flawed. I was realizing that the Bible and the book of Revelation in particular, could be profoundly political. In the 17th century, as the Puritans in America were building their new world, Christians here were living in a world of political and religious chaos in the aftermath of the Civil War. The old authoritarian order had been swept away. In 1649, a small group of men and women led by radical Christian Gerard Wynne Stanley occupied some common land near Weybridge in Surrey. This is St George's Hill, a private estate, gated community with its own golf course and just about everything else. But it's also the unlikely setting of the diggers' revolutionary movement. Inspired by the book of Revelation, they seized these pastures in order to build their vision of the new world. I'm not sure if this is what they had in mind. Like John on Patmos, Wynne Stanley believed he had received a divine vision and God had instructed him to act. What did God tell him to do? He believed that God called him uh, to, to gather people together, to um, basically to, to eat together, to share bread together, to work together um, for the common good. And his interpretation of that was then to see the common lands, which were very poorly utilised and underused. And he got off his backside, went up onto the hill with a group of people and started digging the common land. What was the role of the Book of Revelation in the life of the diggers? Well, the Book of Revelation was incredibly important because, you know, you put yourself in his place in the 17th century. Uh, you, the king has been executed. The Church of England is dissolved. The bishops have gone. Everything is up for grabs. The world is turned upside down. And he really believed this was the time which the Book of Revelation was written about. It was a time that the new order was coming in. So he didn't see the Book of Revelation as this book dealing with the end of the world, but he saw it as the beginning of a whole new society, a new order, which God was going to bring in. But the world God had instructed Win Stanley to create couldn't survive. This radical social movement threatened the power of the authorities, and within months, the diggers were thrown off St George's Hill. The diggers' dream of a utopian world had failed, but for a brief moment, the persecuted had found a voice in the words of their Bible. They were following John's call to resist their oppressors, but this time, though, the battle was not between empires and religious faith, but between authoritarian rule and the need for social justice. In the late 18th century, a new prophet stepped forward to champion the oppressed, and once more it was revelation that showed the way. William Blake, renowned artist, poet and visionary, was commissioned to illustrate the book. Though Blake was born just over 100 years after the Diggers' Revolt, he grew up in a world of radical Christian thought which echoed that of Wynne Stanley. His parents were dissenters, part of a Christian sect which had separated from the established church, and Blake grew to oppose the idea of a theology that repressed man and permitted injustice. I'm going to see his illustration of chapters 4 and 5 from the book of Revelation, in which John sees heaven for the first time. When I look at this, I see God enthroned in heaven and everyone paying homage. 
What am I missing? I think the most important thing to say is that he has understood what is there in the Bible and was actually expressing what's there in the text. Blake gets one to kind of focus on the central image of God and we will be pardoned, I think, for missing the fact that the most important image is right there at the bottom, just below the feet of the Almighty, uh, what looks like a dead animal. And it's there in the book of Revelation chapter 5 that John sees... After he's seen the Almighty, he sees a lamb that is slain. And uh, the lamb who is slain is a symbol of Christ, the one who identifies with the meek and lowly. And so the meek and lowly are drawn into this picture, identifying with the lamb who is slain, who is the key to history. If Blake is telling us that the lamb symbolizes the common person, is he also telling us that the common person has incredible power to change their world, to bring about the new heaven? I've absolutely no doubt at all that he's doing that. What he wants to do is to say, look, uh, uh, realize who you are, realize that the divine image is already there in you, and if you've got that, then you will be uh, empowered uh, not only to be better persons for yourself, but also in relating to other people. So we have here in Blake's depiction of Revelation a manifesto for social change, is that correct? Uh, I think in every work that Blake did, was, in a sense, a manifesto for social change and how it is that humans need to change in order to bring it about. To me, the battle that's affected my life the most directly was waged in America in the 1960s. On the 31st of July, 1966, the Black Liberation Theology Movement hit the streets of America when 51 African-American pastors took out a full-page advertisement in the New York Times demanding an end to racism and racial segregation. When American leaders are forced by American people to quit misusing and abusing American power, then will the cry for black power become inaudible, for the framework in which all power in America operates would include the power and experience of black men as well as those of white men. I can't imagine the impact that this must have had on American society. I mean, just picture it. The churches calling for all Americans to stand firm and resist white racism. It seems to me that this is what the Book of Revelation might have sounded like if it were written in the 20th century. Professor James Cone was a pioneer of the new black liberation theology. The key thing about the Book of Revelation and the oppressed is that John himself and the Christian churches that he is writing to in the book of Revelations are living under a similar situation that blacks perceive themselves to be living under. Black people didn't have to go to seminary to know that the Bible spoke to them. They didn't have to go to the university to know that that, that that situation was analogous to the poor and the weak and the helpless within the Bible. So in the 1960s, who was the beast for black America? Who was the beast in the black community as they saw? White supremacy, white power, the US government, which refused to acknowledge their right of citizenship. We were fighting for the right to vote in the 1960s. Was America Babylon? Yes, America was Babylon, it's the beast. We felt we were living in Babylon. So within the 1960s struggle, black power is not that far removed from the new heaven. I mean, you have to shout it when you've been denied it more than uh, 350 years. You have to shout it, you have to go crazy about it. And that's what's happening within John's vision. People are going crazy about the new heaven and the new earth. I lived during the 1960s. The vision of a new America, a new Jerusalem, was prominent and powerful during that time. King spoke of it as his dream. He spoke of it as the beloved community. That's the new Jerusalem. There he is preaching, I've been on the mountaintop. I've seen the other side. I was there. We believed that it was going to come. And in some sense, some people will say Barack Obama is the realization of that. So is America still the beast? 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether America is a beast. There are a lot of beasts in the world, though. America is not the only beast. But it's a big old beast out there. That's amazing. Professor Cohn has spent his whole life using revelation to fight injustice. I'd never hear anything like that growing up in the church, and definitely not from a Pentecostal pulpit. Today, the Book of Revelation is still being used to fight injustice, and it's been taken right into the heart of the community. In the early 1990s, stories of gang warfare and drug-related violence dominated the headlines of Boston's newspapers. Within the largely poor Latino and African-American neighborhoods of the city, youth crime was spiraling out of control. In 1992, after a gang shooting at a funeral, a group of church ministers banded together to tackle the problem. What the police couldn't solve, the church would. The Reverend Eugene Rivers, a Pentecostal minister, was a founding member of the Ten Point Coalition. One of the ways that we have taken some of the theological themes in Revelation, some of the images and symbols, is to talk about the nature of the beast. The image of a source of evil that exists in the cosmos, in the world, whose bidding I may unwittingly do by acts of evil. When I go to prisons, oh, dudes respond to that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Dude, don't disrespect yourself. Don't do the work of the beast by disrespecting yourself. Oh, I'm telling you, oh man, cats, woo! So the image of the beast now must be reinterpreted for a generation of young people who do not understand the nature of the evil and the system that's against them. The Ten Point Coalition began working within the communities to combat a culture of violence amongst the youth. Today, the police actively seek their help. As law enforcement, we have an enforcement aspect down pat. Boom, we can knock them out. But yeah. there's a part of it that we can't take on. We can offer a certain amount of degree to that effect as far as law enforcement, but I think clergy has to really um, solidify the deal. The book is subversive. From Genesis to Revelation, it's subversive. And there is subversive, radically egalitarian content that is emancipatory, that is reconciling, right? All of which the church ignores because it's just very uncomfortable. For more than two millennia, apocalyptic writings have come out of times of great social and political upheaval. Those moments when the establishment is held in suspicion and the oppressed find their voice. Today, more than ever before, a crisis threatens to engulf us all. And surprisingly, the Book of Revelation may hold the key to understanding how we deal with it. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, the throne, and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he showed me and a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. 2,000 years ago, on the island of Patmos, John wrote of a battle between good and evil. The Christian faith faced the enemy of the Roman Empire. Today, the battle continues, but it is the earth itself that is now at stake. In the face of impending disaster brought about by climate change, it's easy to see why environmental protesters use apocalyptic images from the Book of Revelation to shock us into acting. When I was growing up, my vision of the end of the world was the nuclear bomb. I'd never envisaged that my children's generation would face an even greater threat. There's only like so much like the earth can take, so like we have to be like preserving the world now for like future generations. I think we'll probably like kind of destroy ourselves in a sense. How do we even know that the world is dying? Like how do we know that it's not just meant to happen? Animals die all the time and they become extinct. What if it's just our turn to become extinct? The book of Revelation is a book that says you must fight 
to save the world. Is it right to read the book of Revelation that way? Maybe it is about pollution and whatever's happening now, but I think it's like, well, we need to be prepared for whatever's going to happen to us in the future. It's not necessarily about climate change, but it shows that, like, um, everything's not set in, set in stone, we're not powerless, and we shouldn't just, like, overlook it all. When it was written, they didn't know what was going to happen, so how could it possibly be about climate change? John is writing about anything that creates tyranny, disaster, believers have to resist. Can I use that in the future and apply it to climate change in the I Book of Revelation? I would say climate change was tyranny. But um, you could, but I don't, I think it's a crazy man writing from a cave thousands of years ago. It may well be the ramblings of a crazy man writing from a cave, but the message that he's given to stop people being lazy and to take up action against oppression and um, tyranny and all forms of it is a really good message. And it seems that the church is uniting behind this message. Thousands of Christians believe, as I do, that we have a duty to save the planet and that by making ourselves heard, we can bring about a change that will preserve our world. It looks in the last few decades particularly, and perhaps the last few millennia, as if the human race has on the whole not been very good news for the rest of creation. We depend on the health of the world around us. And because of that, the health of the world around us and our own long-term health are not two things but one. Let's not lose sight. We are living in the last days. Revelation time. Why is the book of Revelation appealing to the Green Movement and environmentalists? Because the book of Revelation comes out of a situation where um, people um, are at their wit's end, they don't know where to look, um, and they're faced with a, an incredibly powerful and oppressive uh, regime, the, the Roman regime. And, and the book um, talks about the possibilities of hope there. And it's a situation which is analogous with the situation that we face today. So it calls for a different way of organizing our economy, a different way of, of organizing uh, our whole society, in fact. Do we really care about climate change? Does it affect our behavior? If it doesn't, are we actually complicit with the ongoing destruction. The question is where we stand in relation to the future. It's exactly the prophetic question. It seems to me the environmentalist movement are using the cataclysmic apocalyptic visions in Revelation to inspire us to fight for heaven on earth. Now, whether we're frightened into doing that or inspired, they don't really care so long as we act. We're here because God's creation is under threat because of climate change. Um, we live at a unique point in history where if we're not careful, we're going to throw the whole of the planet into imbalance. What do you find within the book of Revelation to help make sense of your environmental campaign? It's a crazy book, isn't it? And um, sometimes people say, oh, all the wild weather, oh, isn't that climate change? It's all been foretold. The question is agency. Who's changing the climate? Is it God or is it us? I believe in free will. If we are going to burn fossil fuels and destabilize the planet, that has nothing to do with God. God might be weeping while we do this. If there is a beast in the subject of climate change, it's the beast in all of us. It's the beast that is consumption. The fact that we are taking up um, resources which took millions and millions of years to be formed in the Earth's crust and are using them at an extraordinary rate. It's, you know, when you look at the message of getting people animated against Hitler, against the threat of invasion, you can point to an external enemy. This time, the enemy is within. It's our own patterns of living. It's not an external beast. I think there's a beast of consumption which is within, and I think that's the one we have to concentrate on. Western civilization oscillates between two models. It oscillates between this Book of Revelation horror story, and it oscillates between the end of the Book of Revelation, which has this astonishingly beautiful image of the city of God coming down out of heaven in which everyone lives in peace, the, the waters are there, the trees are for the healing of the nations. So we've swung, we swing between apocalypse, scare everybody, terrify them into behaving properly, and utopia. It's easy to read the book of Revelation and be seduced by it. All those images of blood and vengeance could have come straight from Hollywood. 
And just like watching a horror film, we love the power that those terrifying images have. And that's why so few people remember the world at the end. If you get all the way through the 66 books in the Bible, you get back to where you started on page one. A glorious, untainted world created by God. The book of Revelation speaks to everybody. It just doesn't say the same message to everybody. It doesn't always say the message that you want to hear, but it does speak to all people. Really, it's a book of pictures, it's a book of images, it's a book that's evoking something to try and get a response out of people, not something that's going to give you a detailed plan for how the world is going to be forevermore. The literal meaning makes most sense, it helps us to understand chronologically, and it leaves no room for misinterpretation by man inserting his own opinions there. The text is meant to be taken literally. I am now convinced that the last book of the Bible is the most misunderstood piece of writing in history. Today, I simply cannot accept that terrifying literal interpretation that I was taught as a boy in the Pentecostal church. Everything I've discovered and learned has proven that the book of Revelation is best not and probably should not be read as a guidebook to the end of the earth. Instead, I'm with those revolutionaries from the early Christians onwards who were inspired by its message to the oppressed and persecuted. Today, 2,000 years on from John having his vision, I believe his message still speaks to all of us committed to building the new heaven and the new earth.